Welcome to National Thrombosis Week. I'd like to introduce Chiknesh Patel, consultant pharmacist in anticoagulation at King's College Hospital, who will talk about overcoming problems with anticoagulation. Thank you, Chik. Thank you, Professor Arya. Um, so my talk is going to focus on some of the things to expect um, with anticoagulation therapy, and then some of the, importantly, some of the problems that uh, patients might experience and how um, we can tackle those. And I guess it's important to note that anticoagulation is slowing down how fast the blood is clotting. So a lot of patients um, will report when they take anticoagulants that they're bruising easily. And so a question that patients often have is, am I taking too much of the anticoagulation? Well, the, the bruising um, happens because the blood is a clotting at a slower rate than when you weren't on anticoagulation therapy. And in some ways, if you knock yourself and you bruise, it's quite reassuring to see the bruise appear because it, it shows that the anticoagulation therapy is working. So in many ways, when bruises appear, if you knock yourself by accident, then it, it's not a problem because it's, it's an effect of the anticoagulation. When we worry as clinicians, if patients bruise out of the blue, so say one morning you wake up and you have a big bruise across your chest and you haven't fallen over or knocked yourself there, then that would be a concern. And in those situations, we would advise that you seek medical attention. But bruising when you've knocked yourself is, is absolutely normal when you're on anticoagulation. The next um, sort of question that patients often have are around um, bleeding and uh, what you notice when you're on anticoagulation are things like if you brush your teeth, um, you may notice a spot of blood there. Some patients um, experience nosebleeds um, when they're on anticoagulation, and that can be uh, of concern, and I can certainly relate to that. What um, we would suggest if you do suffer from nosebleeds um, when you're starting anticoagulation is to flag that up with the anticoagulation team because they can certainly provide you with some advice on trying to minimize any problems. It's important to note that anticoagulants don't cause nosebleeds, but of course, if you have a nosebleed, it will be heavier. And so some of the simple measures that can be taken to try and prevent nosebleeds in the first place would be um, to um, not to blow your nose hard um, when you blow your nose, um, not to let your nose become too dry as well. And there are products that you can buy to just help moisten um, the inside of the nostrils, which would um, hopefully try and prevent nosebleeds in the first place. For some people, even those measures aren't effective. And in those situations, it's worth discussing with the anticoagulation clinic because you may need input from a specialist doctor um, to look inside the nose to try and prevent those nosebleeds, particularly if you're gonna be on anticoagulation for a, a, a long period of time. Another um, area where um, questions um, can come up um, for women this is focused on is um, when they're menstruating or when they're having their periods because of course anticoagulants um, are slowing down how fast the blood is clotting so women um, will notice that their periods are heavier than um, when prior to starting the anticoagulation again this is absolutely normal because of the way the anticoagulants work. But what we don't want is for you to be having periods where you're having to change your sanitary towels or your sanitary products every 30 minutes. If you find yourself in that situation, you should be discussing with the anticoagulation clinic about what um, support can be provided because there's a number of things that can be done which could help um, to minimize that problem um, for you going forward. That can range from prescribing other medications, which helps to manage um, bleeding during menstruation, 
um, to um, use in an alternative anticoagulant where you may be on one which um, is causing you a problem, but when we switch to another type of anticoagulant, it becomes less of a problem. So um, if um, this is something that, that you're worried about or is affecting you, then you should certainly discuss that with the anticoagulation clinic. Please don't suffer in silence. And this is something that um, often gets asked is, what if I'm in an accident? Are there reversal agents available when I'm on an anticoagulant therapy? And um, as Professor Aria has previously um, stated, there are um, reversal agents available. When we use warfarin, um, we've got two neat anti um, uh, uh, reversal agents available. And with the newer anticoagulants, there are also reversal um, agents. Often we haven't needed to use the reversal agents with the newer ones because they don't hang about in the body as long as warfarin does. But just to reassure you, there are agents available to help doctors, nurses and pharmacists manage any bleeding should the need arise. And then moving on to some of the what if um, areas that patients often have um, questions around. Um, the first one is around um, taking the anticoagulant. So after a blood clot, um, you may be at home for a few weeks and then uh, as your convalescence period has um, passed, you'll be going back to work perhaps. And at that time, um, you're, you, may, um, you, you may forget to take an anticoagulant dose. So what do you do in that situation? Well, if you're in the initial stages of treatment, then um, depending on the anticoagulant drug you've been prescribed, um, the anticoagulation clinic may advise you to take the dose as soon as possible, as, as you remember, and then continue as normal. If you're in the stage where you're at the preventative stage and you're on a long-term anticoagulant, then um, the advice is usually just to miss that dose and then continue as normal. So it really depends on where you are in your treatment cycle to what specific advice uh, you should follow. And as Emma previously alluded to, when you're initially started on the anticoagulant, this is something that the team will discuss with you and provide you with written information. But if you're unsure, then of course, get in touch with your team. The other question that comes up um, from um, the women's perspective is, what if I find myself pregnant or what if I want to become pregnant and I'm on an anticoagulant? Um, is that possible? And the answer to that is yes. Some of our anticoagulants are known to be problematic during pregnancy, but in our armory, we do have anticoagulants, which we know to be safe and have a lot of experience in using. So um, if you do want to become pregnant or find yourself pregnant, then um, it's something you should discuss with the anticoagulation clinic as soon as possible so that an individualized plan um, can be instigated for you. And similarly, if once you've had the baby, um, the question arises, can I breastfeed um, my, my child? And again, the answer to that is absolutely yes. We have anticoagulants, which we know to be safe in the breastfeeding um, setting. So if this is something that is important to you, then um, we can prescribe you a, a safe anticoagulant, which would um, support you in that endeavor. In terms of food and drinks, are there foods and drinks that you should avoid? Um, well, it depends on the type of anticoagulant you're on to whether you um, need to avoid um, any types of foods. And I hesitate in using the word avoid because even um, with certain anticoagulants, it's not about avoiding, but just being aware. So the overall answer to this is that in terms of foods, um, we know that the traditional anticoagulant warfarin um, is affected by vitamin K rich foods. So foods like 
broccoli, spinach, parsley, which have high levels of vitamin K can impact on the warfarin control. Our advice in the anticoagulation clinic is not to avoid those foods, but just not to make drastic changes in your diet so that when we're working out your warfarin requirements, um, we can work it out around your regular food intake. If you suddenly decide to go on the Atkins diet, then you should let the anticoagulation clinic know if you're on warfarin, because that could affect your um, warfarin control. For the newer anticoagulants, so medications such as apixaban or rivaroxaban, um, there's um, no food interactions with these anticoagulants. So in a sense, you, you don't have to um, be too concerned about the, the types of foods um, that you might um, consume. In terms of alcohol, with all anticoagulants, our advice is um, to stick to the Department of Health guidance on alcohol consumption, which is 14 units over a week as a maximum. And uh, particularly if you're on warfarin, we would advise to spread that consumption um, over a period of time as opposed to consuming it um, a, a large amount of alcohol in a, in a night or two, because again, that will affect your warfarin um, control. And then lastly, um, a lot of our patients um, ask, is it safe to take vitamins or herbal supplements um, from places um, that you, you may wish um, to take? And the answer to that is, um, it depends on what it is to whether it's okay to take. Vitamins um, generally are okay, but uh, again, if you're on a medication like warfarin, um, if, the, if the vitamin has a high vitamin K intake, it could impact on your warfarin control. So our advice in the clinic is, if you want to take a vitamin or a herbal supplement, then please check with uh, the um, anticoagulation clinic staff who have a list of medications which they know um, could be problematic with the anticoagulant and so can advise you appropriately. Generally speaking, lots of things that you, you might want to get from a health food shop are okay with anticoagulant therapy. So where, where, um, where do you go if you have any um, questions or further support or information um, regarding your anticoagulation therapy? Well, of course, as my colleagues have alluded to, um, the doctor, nurse and pharmacist in clinic are all um, suitable people to ask. And if they don't know the answer, they'll certainly direct you to um, the, the person or people that do know the answer. And coming to um, Emma's earlier question around feeling anxious, it is nice to have a support network of people that have perhaps had a blood clot in the past. So you don't feel like you're on your own and um, taking these anticoagulant um, treatments. So where can you access such a support network? Well, the obvious um, place to go is Thrombosis UK, which have a group of individuals uh, or patients um, who, um, who are a, a great support network that you can have um, within um, the, the clotting community. Okay, so um, I'd like to come to the questions that we have um, here. So my first question is to Emma. And um, Emma, if I can ask you, um, some patients worry um, about bleeding. And when they speak to us in clinic, that when they're speaking to their friends, they say that, you know, my friend's on a lower dose, and um, why am I on a standard dose? Um, so why, why is that the case? Thanks, Jig. Yes, good question. Um, first of all, let's talk about the direct oral anticoagulants in that respect. So things like rivaroxaban, apixaban, edoxaban, and dabigatran. Um, each of those drugs has a standard dose and a reduced dose. And they each have slightly different criteria as to 
uh, when you would need the standard dose and when you would need the reduced dose. But to give you an example, um, one that is frequently applied is looking at kidney function. And the reason that we want to look at kidney function is because that all of those medications, once they have um, performed their role within the body, need to be eliminated from the body so that they don't build up. And all of them, to some degree, are eliminated by the kidneys. And so we need to make sure that the kidneys are functioning adequately in order to clear the drug thoroughly from the body once it's finished its job. So um, we look at a person's kidney function, uh, and that will be by blood test. And also we'll want to ask the patient how much they weigh. And we'll perform a calculation that gives us a good idea about how well the kidneys clear waste products from the body. And that will then inform which dose the patient will receive, either the standard or the reduced dose. Some of the anticoagulants, there are some other uh, nuanced um, dose reduction criteria, like perhaps uh, based on a patient's weight. Also, just to briefly um, cover that same question when thinking about warfarin. Now, when we start warfarin, we will often start people um, on a fairly standardized loading dose to get their levels where we want them to be. However, it's impossible to look at somebody and predict how much warfarin they will need in order to keep them stable. And it may well be that that dose fluctuates over time. And to give you um, some sort of context, we have hugely varying doses. So some patients will be on perhaps half a milligram a day, all the way up to people who might be on a 20 or more milligrams per day. Now, it doesn't matter how many milligrams you do need in order to get to that therapeutic level. What's most important is that we keep you in that therapeutic level as much as possible. So please um, don't worry. Try not to compare your dose with somebody else who is on warfarin because it's really irrelevant. It's, it's about the blood tests and making sure that they remain therapeutic and you remain safe. Thank you, Emma. That's very comprehensive. Um, Professor Arya, if I can come to you with the next question. And um, this is a question around, can you um, experience a blood clot whilst you're prescribed an anticoagulant? And if so, what is the management of this? Thank you for that question, Sheikh. It would be unusual to clot while you're taking an anticoagulant. So the first question, I would ask is, were there any misdoses of anticoagulation? And if you're taking warfarin, uh, was the INR in range when the new clot developed? So if the treatment was taken and the dose was correct and someone clots, then some detective work might be necessary. Because uh, to ask whether there's an underlying condition that might uh, cause this apparent resistance to the anticoagulation. For example, you know, uh, something like antiphospholipid syndrome, or whether there is an underlying uh, malignancy, for example. So if the clot has occurred on the right treatment taken at the right dose, then we would usually alter the treatment. Uh, if it occurred with a certain range of warfarin, then one consideration might be increasing that range uh, to better anticoagulate the person. If the clot occurred on a direct oral anticoagulant, then we might have the option of, in the short term, switching to low liquid heparin or even warfarin. For instance, a warfarin is a much better anticoagulant than the direct oral anticoagulants in the setting of antiphospholipid syndrome. So whilst it is an unusual occurrence, uh, usually we would have to have a think about why it might have occurred and if there's a need to alter the treatment. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Arya. Um, Emma, if I can come to you um, again and ask you a question um, that patients sometimes have in that when they've had a blood clot, they may have had treatment for around two months or so, but they still have pain in their leg and they may still be breathless. And um, the question they have is, um, is that normal and, and why is that? Yeah, thanks, Jake. That is something that we do see um, quite commonly. And what we know is that um, 
symptom resolution varies enormously from person to person and it doesn't always correlate with the size of the blood clot that the person's had um, so it may well be that in the first four weeks around the first month most people's blood clot has fully gone by then the blood the body has worked using its own natural anticoagulants to break that clot down however um, around a quarter of people will still have some blood clot there in in their blood vessels and it may well be that that blood clot um, never fully disappears but it will change to become something um, more like scar tissue so it isn't something that's an acute issue that we worry about anymore um, however whether there be clot there or not we know that symptoms can last sometimes for many many months um, if symptoms are still persisting after around the six month mark then we may well look at doing some additional tests for patients who have had a, a blood clot in their lungs a pulmonary embolism and we may well look at assessing a leg for somebody who's had a deep vein thrombosis to see if we think that there are signs or symptoms of post-thrombotic syndrome a chronic syndrome that can come about where the blood clot has caused some damage to the blood vessels but the main um, advice that we tend to give people is to gently and gradually increase the exercise that they're they're doing each day. Um, it long, it's been a long time since we um, thought that you had to go on bed rest when you had a blood clot. So now the advice is, is to mobilize and we know that that helps to strengthen the collateral circulation. And it also helps the body to stay fit and healthy, which helps recovery from any kind of condition. So yes, it is normal and um, and people shouldn't be too concerned if they still have symptoms after a month or two months. They can obviously discuss this with their healthcare professional. And I think it's important to make use of um, simple analgesics like uh, paracetamol and perhaps if they need something stronger, something with codeine in it. Um, avoiding things like ibuprofen and aspirin because of the associated slight increased risk of bleeding. Um, in order to make them comfortable and so that they can go about their their daily life. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, Emma. Um, and then the last question I was going to um, I was going to take, but I might pose it actually to Professor Aria, if that's okay, Professor Aria. Um, so, um, um, if a woman's on HRT and it's helping to control her menopause symptoms, then if she's been advised to stop her HRT, why is that? And what can be done um, in that situation? Thanks for that uh, very important and uh, often asked question, because uh, there is uh, a link between uh, HRT and blood clots. So HRT, the historical data with the oral HRT that we used to use suggested that like the combined pill, HRT here uh, increases the risk of blood clots about between two and fourfold. Uh, and so it was uh, often the tendency of uh, doctors when they admitted or treated patients uh, with venous thromboembolism who are taking HRT to immediately stop that HRT and, uh, you know, to the detriment of the patient with uh, menopausal symptoms are often returning in a big way. So uh, I think the first answer is, you know, do not uh, be in a hurry to stop the HRT because if you are taking anticoagulation, that certainly you know, almost completely mitigates the uh, uh, risk of blood clots to do with the HRT. And then uh, in a considered way, you can uh, have a discussion with your healthcare professional about what the ideal choice of uh, HRT uh, should be in your case if you know HRT was still indicated. And these days, uh, we have the advantage you know, of the kind of newer HRT being transdermal HRT, which is uh, in the form of a patch or a gel, which is absorbed through the skin. And so it does not 
pass through the circulation through the liver or activate the blood clotting. So there's plenty of evidence that uh, transdermal HRT does not activate the blood clotting. And really evidence from looking at the population that unlike the old fashioned HRT, which was the oral HRT, that it does not increase the, blood, uh, the risk of blood clots. So I think uh, uh, number one, if you develop a clot while you're taking HRT, don't stop the HRT in a hurry. And if you were on transdermal HRT, when you develop the clot, then it's unlikely to be a significant risk factor in causing the blood clot. But if you're on oral HRT, then you know the anticoagulation will mitigate any risk, giving you time to have a considered discussion about what the optimal choice of HRT is going forward. And really, safety-wise, uh, transdermal HRT, usually in combination with micronized progesterone or utrogestan, is a very safe option, even in women with thrombophilia or who've had previous clots. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Arya.